हेलो एवरीवन एंड वेलकम टू इकोनॉमिक सर्वे लेक्चर सीरीज 2022-23 दिस इज लेक्चर नंबर फोर डू यू रिमेंबर दैट व्हेन कोविड स्टक द इंडियन इकोनॉमी एज वेल एज द ग्लोबल इकोनॉमी देर वाज अ वर्कर हु वाज फ्रॉम मध्य प्रदेश हु वाज स्टक इन कर्नाटका अ वर्कर फ्रॉम यूपी वॉज स्टक इन डेली अ स्टूडेंट फ्रॉम बिहार वॉज स्टक इन तमिलनाडु सो पीपल फ्रॉम वन पार्ट ऑफ द कंट्री वर स्टक इन एन अदर पार्ट and when the covid lockdown was announced whatever mode of transportation was available whether railway whether trucks buses road transportation or flight services people did not look at it they simply caught that mode of transportation and people wanted to go back to their hometown or native place roads railway airport and all these mode of transportation this falls in a category called as infrastructure when people went back to their hometowns the government started multiple schemes to help them sometimes the government wanted to provide food grains to people so the government needed to give that information to the public similarly the government started to give cash subsidy to the public but going to the bank physically was not possible so at that time since internet was available in our cities towns and villages people could use their smartphones and access banking services to take care of their financial requirement as well as the students who were stuck at home could not physically go to schools and colleges they were taking help of mobile phone laptop and this led to the beginning of digital education in india in a very dominant manner so today's lecture that we are going to have talks about these two things the first thing is called as physical infrastructure and the second aspect is called as digital infrastructure so we are going to study two types of infrastructure this is lecture number 4 topic number 12 of economic survey which is called as physical and digital infrastructure lifting potential growth the economic survey is arguing in this chapter that if we promote infrastructure both physical and digital it will lead to the economic growth and development of the country in multiple manner we are going to have a look at it as usual before we start the topic let us have a look at the lecture plan so we are going to divide this topic called infrastructure into two parts first is called physical infrastructure the second is called as digital infrastructure in physical infrastructure we will divide it in two sections the first section will have definition of infrastructure and the second part will be policies related to infrastructure so guys you know currently we are having four major policies related to infrastructure the first policy is called as national infrastructure pipeline the second policy is called as national monetization pipeline the third policy is called as pm gati shakti and the fourth policy is called as national logistics policy which was started in the year 2022 which means one year back we are going to have a look at all of that after we look at the policy then we will have a look at the model of infrastructure creation in india because model is very important model gives us an idea about who is doing what in infrastructure construction like road school hospital after looking at the model we will also look at different methods of infrastructure finance in india having looked at it we are going to do a sectoral assessment of what has happened in last one or two years in the field of roads railway port inland waterway and power second part of this topic will discuss digital infrastructure so for example all of you must be using upi that's a digital infrastructure similarly whenever you you, you do online shopping etc you do it through a smartphone or a laptop that's digital infrastructure so we are going to look at what is the meaning of digital public infrastructure we will look at the meaning of that then we will look at india's journey in the field of digital infrastructure digital infrastructure has some important components we are going to look at those components as well and then we will look at one policy by government of india called as digital india program 2015 so guys the first thing to look at is definition of infrastructure what is infrastructure see so for example if we look at this picture what do you see here you see there is a there are people here there are roads here you can see there is a bus stop there are vehicles similarly let us have a look at this there is train that means there must be a railway station railway platform and there is a lot of public here you know they say that infrastructure is the lifeline of a country infrastructure provides engine to the economic growth so what is infrastructure 
physical facilities for example roads bus stop railway station these are physical facilities institutions we have a traffic management system that's an institution then we have organizational structure entire railway is an organization so physical facilities institution organizations and social and economic foundations all these things taken together which helps in the progress growth and development of a society is called as infrastructure this is a very generic definition which is actually given in this year's economic survey now what are the benefits of having infrastructure how does infrastructure help in the progress of a society you see for example if we construct a road like this there are people who get employment so yes once a person gets employment the income increases and then poverty comes down so infrastructure directly leads to employment generation and poverty reduction once this road is ready imagine this that suppose the government of india has spent 20 crore rupees in the construction of this road example because of this road you see there are these factories i have taken this picture from from noida where a samsung manufacturing plant has been established recently just because of a 20 crore rupees road like this a factory has been set up here and in setting up the factory samsung has spent roughly 100 crore rupees for example this concept is called as crowding in the meaning of crowding in is whenever government spends some amount in the construction of infrastructure private sector spends a bigger amount in establishment of industries and other facilities so because of infrastructure crowding in also happens now <clears throat> imagine that this road is ready what will happen because of that because of that it will become so easy for the students and for the children to go to school and colleges it will also become so easy for patients to reach the hospital this is called as improved access to public assets now because of that positive externality has happened what is the meaning of positive externality so for example if you do a certain job with some objective in mind but it also leads to other benefits that is called positive externality so suppose i create a garden in my house i created the garden because i like flowers plants and trees but my neighbor also gets clean air and my neighbor also gets visual pleasure looking at my garden so the visual pleasure and the clean air that my neighbor gets is called positive externality we constructed this road so that there can be more industries but because of this road the access of children to school and the access of patients to hospital has improved which is called as positive externality so infrastructure has led to three important benefits for the society the first is called multiplier effect crowding in and positive externality what is multiplier effect you see if the government invests 20 crore rupees in the construction of infrastructure but if people start to earn more income industries start to earn more profit and revenue if hospitals and schools they are also running and people are getting employment there so overall the gdp of india increases by more than 20 crores 20 crore is the cost of construction of infrastructure but gdp of india will rise by more than 20 crore this is called multiplier effect so infrastructure has three important impacts first is multiplier effect second is crowding and then third is positive externality now guys what are the different policies that we have in the field of infrastructure in India? Basically, there are four pillars of infrastructure policies in India. First is called National Infrastructure Pipeline, which set a target between 2020 and 2025. The second policy is called National Monetization Pipeline. It set a target between 2021 to 2025. The third pillar of infrastructure in India is called as PM Gati Shakti. It set a target between 2021 and 2025. And then the fourth pillar is called as National Logistics Policy. It set a target between 2022 and 2030. When we say that it set a target till a particular year, it does not mean that the policy or the program cannot be extended. But it simply means that currently this is the target. If we are unable to meet the target or if we have to increase our target, of course, this timeline can be extended. So let us have a look at all these policies one by one. The government of India has set a target. They want to achieve $5 trillion GDP in India by the year 2025. But guys, we cannot achieve $5 trillion GDP unless we develop agriculture, industry and services. But for sectoral development, the most important thing is to develop the infrastructure. Without, without infrastructure, there is no sectoral development.
So if we want to achieve $5 trillion GDP, we have to go for sectoral development, which means we have to do development of agriculture industry and services. And for the development of agriculture industry and services, we have to develop infrastructure. The government of India made a list of how many infrastructures are required in this country so that India can become a $5 trillion economy. And the calculation of the government of India says that we require roughly 9,000 infrastructure projects and the expenditure on this 9,000 infrastructure projects, the investment will be 111 lakh crores. What is the nature of these infrastructure projects? So these 9,000 infrastructure projects would be related to transportation, energy, water, sanitation, communication, etc. So the government of India created a program called as National Infrastructure Pipeline where the government says that we want to construct 9,000 projects by the year 2025 with an investment of 111 lakh crores. The government of India is putting up all these details that which infrastructure has already begun, which infrastructure investment is about to happen and the progress report card of these projects. It is available on Investment India Grid portal. Whenever the government of India is planning for an investment, which is more than 500 crores in infrastructure, the process of that investment has to be very fast so that we don't lose time and we get timely infrastructure. So whenever such a proposal is made where the infrastructure investment value is more than 500 crore, that proposal directly goes to project monitoring group because they try to increase the speed of the approval related to environment, related to other ministries, so that the project can start and finish very fast. In this year's economic survey, the government of India says, why not integrate Invest India Grid and Project Monitoring Group, so that they will be integrated and whatever information you have to find out related to infrastructure, you can find out in a consolidated manner. Next question that arises in our model called as National Infrastructure Pipeline is how to finance the infrastructure. Because guys, making a list of infrastructure is very easy. 9,000 infrastructures have to be constructed. It's not difficult. But then how to finance it? So the government of India said that the financing will be done by central government, state government and private sector. These will be the three important sources of finance. But are these three sources of finance good enough? Or do we require somebody else? Do we need more innovation in financing? Yes, we need more innovation in financing. Why? Because if these three sources of finance, central government, state government and private sector was good enough, India would have already developed all the infrastructure by now, which means some innovation is required. Did government of India do any innovation? Yes. The name of the innovation is called as National Monetization Pipeline. But to help you understand National Monetization Pipeline, let me take you through a simple example. So guys, suppose that's you and this is your house. So that's your home where you stay. This is your ground floor and this is your first floor. You are a very studious student. You are preparing for UPSC. You are a very hardworking student and you love to read books. So it's been your childhood dream that you want to set up a library like this. Right now, <clears throat> if you want to construct a library just for your own study purposes, the cost of construction is 10 lakh rupees, but you don't have 10 lakh rupees. What to do? So there are two, three ways. First is don't construct the library, but you want to do it because, because you love reading and studying. So what can you do? There is one option. You have two floors. You can request your parents to sell the first floor, get cash, use the cash to construct library. But it's a very bad idea. Why? Because selling one property and getting another, not a good idea. You can have another all option. What is the other option here? Suppose your entire family stays in the ground floor, give the first floor to somebody on rent. Give it on rent for three years, five years, 10 years and keep collecting the rent money. So for example, keep collecting the rent money like this. Once you have 10 lakh rupees in your hand in three years, go and construct the library and then don't put your house on rent. So what did you do? Earlier, your entire family was staying on the ground floor and first floor. But then your family shifted to ground floor and you gave the first floor on rent, which means you monetized your first floor. What is the meaning of monetization? To convert something into money. Earlier, your family was staying in this, you were not getting any rent. But when you put your first floor on rent, 
this property is giving you money, rent. That is called monetization. So what did you do? You took an old property. So guys, old property is called as brownfield. Brownfield property or asset. You took an old property, you monetized it, put it on rent. You got cash and using this cash, you constructed a new property. So guys, new property is called as greenfield property. So brownfield property is monetized to get greenfield property. Can the government of India do the same thing? Of course, government can do the same thing. I'll tell you how. So suppose guys, this is an airport. The government of India has given our airport to private sector for maintenance, for repair, etc. So suppose for 30 years, the government of India gives this airport to private sector like Jaipur, Ahmedabad, Guwahati, Lucknow, all these airports have been given to private sector. So the private sector keeps repairing the airport, maintains the airport. And when passengers like you and I go there, the private sector suppose collects 100 rupees from us. From 100 rupees, the private sector keeps 80. So 100 rupees collected per passenger, private sector keeps 80. Rest 20 rupees, the private sector gives to the government of India as rent. This is called monetization of the airport. So government has not sold the airport. Ownership has not been given to private sector. The private sector is only maintaining the airport and collecting 100 rupees, giving 20 to the government. The government can keep collecting these 20 rupees and when we have enough of fund, the government of India can use these 20 rupees to construct a school, a hospital for this country, a new road or a new airport. So monetization of brownfield properties of government of India can be used to construct greenfield properties. This program by the government of India is called National Monetization Pipeline. And how much? is the amount that the government of India is trying to collect through monetization roughly 6 lakh crore rupees. This is our target. So the government of India wants to give our railway station, roads, our airports, telecom towers to private sector, not the ownership, but only for maintenance. And the government would collect some money from them. That money can be used to construct new infrastructure. And government is planning to collect roughly 6 lakh crores. So guys, out of this 111 lakh crore, 6 lakh crore, the government of India is going to get through monetization. See, so these are the different properties. For example, road, railway, airport, telecom, etc. The government of India is going to monetize them, get 6 lakh crore. This 6 lakh crore will help in the construction of new infrastructure. How many new infrastructures? 9,000 under national infrastructure pipeline. So this program of monetizing the assets is called as national monetization pipeline. So we have studied two things, national infrastructure pipeline and national monetization pipeline. Now let me give you another example. So guys, imagine that there's a beautiful street in front of your house. Go to different parts of India and you'll find this. One day you are standing in the balcony and you see that somebody is coming and they have started to dig the right side of the road. So there is a beautiful road in front of your house. The road looks like this. Somebody came and start to dig the right side of this road, this side of the road. You ask them, why are you digging the road? It's a beautiful road which was constructed one month back. So that team will tell you, that, sir or ma'am, we are putting a gas pipeline there. You feel very bad. You tell that set of people that, why are you digging the road? You could have put the gas pipeline one month back when the road was being constructed. So they tell you that, no, no, road was constructed by Ministry of Road and Transportation. We are from Ministry of Oil and Gas. And we don't talk to each other. So then you feel very surprised that why are different ministries and departments of the government not talking? And then you say that it's okay, maybe it might have happened only once. But then again, after three months, somebody comes and starts to dig the left side of the road. This time, this side. You ask them, why are you digging the road? So they'll tell you that we are putting up a 5G optical fiber. You will tell them why. Why did you put the 5G optical fiber one month back or three months back? So they will tell you that they are from Ministry of Telecom and they don't talk to Ministry of Oil and Gas and Ministry of Road. Which means different ministries and departments of the government who have the responsibility of infrastructure, they don't talk and interact with each other efficiently. So if the Ministry of Road would have known that Ministry of Oil and Gas and Ministry of Telecom are going to dig the road, Ministry of Road and Transport would have delayed the construction of the road. First gas pipeline would have been put. 
So the government of India also felt very bad and the government of India made a list of all the important ministries and departments, roughly 16 ministries and departments. The government made a list of them and the government told them that all the ministries and departments who have the responsibility of infrastructure construction, they have to share their past, present and future infrastructure related data with each other so that wastage of public money can stop and the infrastructure construction speed can increase in this country. This program whereby the coordination and cooperation under different ministries and department is increasing is called as PM Gati Shakti. So see, <clears throat> what is happening under that? Under PM Gati Shakti, the government of India is trying to, under PM Gati Shakti, the government of India is trying to increase the coordination and cooperation among different ministries so that the wastage of public money can stop and infrastructure construction speed can increase. What are the seven engines of Gati Shakti? Engines of Gati Shakti means these are the seven focus areas of Gati Shakti. Road, railway, airport, port, mass transport, waterway and logistics. These are the seven engines of Gati Shakti, which means focus areas. And through Gati Shakti, the government is trying to increase the partnership between central government, state government and private sector. An ultimate objective of Gati Shakti is to increase the coordination between different departments and ministries and reduce public wastage of public funds. So guys, we have studied three things, national infrastructure pipeline, national monetization pipeline and PM Gati Shakti. PM Gati Shakti is not a scheme of economics, it's a scheme of good governance. But when all these things are happening in India, there is one problem, which was observed by government of India. The government of India observed that suppose there is a factory which is manufacturing mobile phones in Hyderabad, Andhra. The price of the mobile phone there is 10,000 rupees. But when the same mobile phone reaches Assam or Arunachal Pradesh, the price of the mobile phone becomes 18,000 rupees. Why? This is a hypothetical example I am taking. Why does the price of the mobile phone increase? It becomes 18,000 in Arunachal and Andhra, I will tell you. Because when we manufacture the mobile phone, in for example, Hyderabad, then we package the mobile phone in nice boxes and those mobile phones are then put up on this truck. So we load the mobile phone on these trucks. By the way, they also say that India is a truck nation. They call India as truck nation. Why? Because 60% transportation in this country, 6-0, 60% transportation in this country happens through trucks. So the mobile phone are packaged, uh, the mobile phones are packaged, then the mobile phone is loaded on the truck, the truck starts to move on the roads. 60% transportation through uh, you know, roads, which means there is heavy traffic, traffic jams. After 4-5 months, the mobile phone will reach northeast and east of India. And there, the mobile phone will be stored in a warehouse. From the warehouse, the mobile phone will be distributed. So packaging in Hyderabad, then transportation means courier and then a storage in east and northeast and then distribution. All these things are very costly in India. It is so costly that ultimately the final price of the goods in India produced in one part of the country and if it is sold in another part, it rises a lot. Similarly, when we export something out of India, the cost of transportation, storage, packaging is so high that our exported items become costly. So the government of India said there is no advantage of having national infrastructure pipeline, monetization of pipeline and Gati Shakti if we cannot reduce the cost of storage, transportation, packaging and distribution. So guys, storage, transportation, packaging and distribution, these four things together are called as logistics. And the government of India launched another program in India called as national logistics policy to reduce the cost of logistics. Let me show you that policy. So national logistics policy was created in 2022. So first of all, let us try to understand what is the meaning of logistics. I've already told you there is one general meaning of logistics. What is the general meaning of logistics? See, there is a factory where goods are being produced. There is raw material, worker and machines are being used in the factory. Then through transportation, the finished product reaches the warehouse. From warehouse, the product reaches the consumer. So if you look at this picture, the picture tells you that packaging in the factory, then transportation, storage and distribution. These things together are called as logistic 
in a normal sense. But government of India gave a different definition of logistic in the year 2017. So government of India defined logistic by saying that in India, three facilities will be called as logistic facilities in terms of infrastructure. First is called multi-model logistic park. What is a multi-model logistic park? See guys. So for example, you can see here that suppose there is a factory which has manufactured mobile phones. Mobile phone through trucks have reached this seaport through Trains also, mobile phones have reached this seaport. In this seaport, the trucks have brought the mobile phone and now trains have brought the mobile phone. And from this logistics park, the mobile phone will be loaded on the ships through these containers and mobile phones will be exported. So here you can see that there is availability of truck, railway, ship, airport, helicopter facilities, all different type of facilities are available related to transportation. So it is called multi-model transportation. So <clears throat> multi-model logistic park has different type of logistic facilities available inside it. The government of India says that to construct multi-model logistic parks, the minimum investment in India should be 50 crore minimum area 10 acres. Similarly, guys, cold chain is another type of logistics in India. What is cold chain? Where facilities related to cold storage is there. So minimum investment in cold chain 15 crore, minimum area 20,000 square feet. Similarly, warehouse is another type of logistics in India. Minimum investment 25 crore, minimum area 1 lakh square feet. So now these three are the different types of logistic infrastructure in this country. UPSC can ask you these questions where they will ask you this investment and this area. Let us look at the logistics sector overview in India. How is it performing? So you see between 2019 to 2024, it is expected that the growth rate of logistics sector in India will be around 15.5%, which is in double digit, which is a very good rate of growth. The jobs created in logistics sector between 2019 to 2024 is expected to be around two to three crores. Now, if you look at the cost of logistic in India, what did I tell you? What is the logistics meaning of logistics? Meaning of logistics is packaging, transportation, storage and distribution. The cost of logistic in India is so high that it is 18% of GDP. If our income is 100 rupees, national income is 100 rupees, 18% of that, 18 rupees is the cost of logistics, very, very high. And what is the global cost of logistic? 8% of GDP. So government of India has created a target that we want to reduce the cost of logistic by 2030. We want to reduce this 14% logistics cost and we want to make it 8% by 2030. This is our target. Now, if you look at the transportation system in India, why is the logistic cost very high in India? There's a reason for that. See, 60% transportation in India happens through roads. See, India is a truck nation. Roughly 35% transportation in India happens, happens through railways and roughly 5% happens through waterway. So suppose there is a river which connects Bengal and Bihar. And if I have to transport something, people or goods, I will use the boats to transport something from Bihar to Bengal, Bengal to Bihar through the river. That is called waterway. So waterway transportation 5%. So if you look at India, the, the dominant source of transportation is roads. Roads lead to traffic jam, roads lead to delay, and there is excess pressure on the road. But if you look at the global scenario, across the world, on an average, 25% transportation happens through road, 60% through railway, and 15 through waterway. So the contribution of rail and waterway in the world transportation is 75%. And the contribution of rail and waterway transportation in India is 40%. So this is the problem in India and road leads to a lot of traffic jam and delays, which means rail and waterway in India has been underutilized. So under national logistics policy, the government of India is trying to increase the contribution of rail and waterway. Now, <clears throat> the World Bank has found out through logistics performance index, what is the rank of India compared to other countries in the world in terms of logistics? So see, our rank in 2014 in the world was 54. This is by World Bank. In 2016, our rank improved. It became 35 better. And in 2018, again, 44, which means our over-dependency on roads, etc. is causing the problem. So the government of India has created a target that by the year 2030, we want India's rank 
ग्लोबल रैंक इन लॉजिस्टिक्स परफॉर्मेंस इंडेक्स टू बी 25 अंडर टॉप 25 इन द वर्ल्ड सो गाइस व्हाट हैव वी सीन सो फार दैट अंडर नेशनल लॉजिस्टिक्स पॉलिसी वी वांट टू थिंग्स फर्स्ट वी वांट दैट द कॉस्ट ऑफ लॉजिस्टिक इन इंडिया शुड रिड्यूस फ्रॉम 14 परसेंट टू एट परसेंट ऑफ जी एंड वी ऑल्सो वॉन्ट दैट रैंक ऑफ इंडिया ग्लोबल रैंक ऑफ इंडिया इन लॉजिस्टिक्स परफॉर्मेंस इंडेक्स विच इज ब्रॉड बाई वर्ल्ड बैंक इंडिया रैंक शुड बिकम टॉप ट्वेंटी How are we going to achieve this? The government of India, under National Logistics Policy 2022, has said that we will achieve this through Comprehensive Logistics Action Plan (CLAP). We have created this so that our over-dependence on roads should come down, our cost should come down, and we are going to do all these things digitally. We are going to manage all the data and everything digitally. This is the plan of government of India. Now let us look at something very interesting called as leads. Logistics is across different state. It is given in the economic survey this year. So guys, this leads is a ranking which government of India provides to different states and union territories of India based on their performance in logistics. This ranking system started in India in the year 2018 and a ranking was also done in 2022. We are going to study that. Ministry of Commerce and Industry has a department called as DPIIT Department for Promotion of Industries and Internal Trade DPIIT has a division called Logistics Division what they do is they divide all the states and union territories of India into four categories first is called as coastal states second is landlocked and hinterland landlocked means UP MP etc and then northeast and then union territories all these four different type of states and union territories in india then they are judged on the basis of three criteria first they are judged on the basis of how their infrastructure is then they are judged on the basis of services and then they are judged on the basis of operating and regulatory environment for example how easy it is to get permissions in a particular state so based on these three things ranking is provided to the state score is provided out of 100 and then we try to find out which score which state or union territory has a very high score those who have high score we say that logistics situation in that state or union territory is very good so based on these three criteria infrastructure service and operating and regulatory environment we have given scores and we have calculated logistics is across different states which is leads now if you look at the scores more than 90% score is achieved by these states they are called as achievers 80 to 90% scores is achieved by these states they are called as fast movers because they are moving very fast and less than 80% score is achieved by these states they are called as aspirers so we have divided the states again based on the score that they got and achievers fast mover and inspirer this is supposed to increase and improve competition between the states to provide better logistics facility so what did we observe so far we have studied few important things first of all we studied national infrastructure pipeline where we are trying to construct 9000 infrastructure projects with 111 lakh crores one of the sources of finance is national monetization pipeline which is going to give 6 lakh crore to national infrastructure pipeline then we are trying to improve the logistics situation in this country through national logistics policy for ease of movement of goods etc in this country and to look at all these things manage these things properly so that there is no conflict between different departments and ministries we have started pm gati shakti these four together are called as the four pillars of infrastructure in india so now let us have a look at different methods of infrastructure finance that we are currently using in india now guys suppose that's your uh, hometown where you are staying it could be a town it could be a city it could be a village and suppose that there is a market area here whereby there is a school hospital and market and now imagine that the distance between this village and the market school and hospital is a lot the people of this town and village have been demanding that the government should provide a very nice quality road which would connect this town or village with the market area school and hospital but this is a very difficult kind of geography let's say it's a hilly area and it's not very easy to construct road the government of india arranges the land and then government of india realizes that it's very costly to construct and government of india does not have that expertise so land is arranged by government of india and then government of india calls private sector 
for example the government might call out any good private sector which has been performing really well in last four five years in india and the government might say that the private sector's responsibility will be to design the road construct the road arrange finance for the construction of the road so suppose the cost of construction of the road is 80000 crore so the private sector has to arrange 80000 crores and then once the road has been constructed suppose the construction time is one year after the road construction is complete the private sector has to take care of the road for next 30 years so operations and maintenance so what will the private sector do the private sector will do design construction finance operations and maintenance and for all this the cost is 80000 crores the government of india invites the private sector and says hey private sector can you do that i will provide you the land the private sector says of course i can do it the model is called public private partnership because government is providing the land private sector is doing the rest of the things but the private sector asks two things the private sector tells the government of india that government please tell me if you are going to let me collect profit and number two how will you return my money so now the private sector tells the government of india that private sector wants 99000 crore as the total amount which is the sum of cost plus profit cost of construction 80000 crore private sector wants a profit of 19000 crore total 99000 crore so the private sector tells the government that private sector wants 99000 crore in return the government tells the private sector that private sector can have this by collecting toll taxes whenever the road is ready and the, when the vehicles pass through this road private sector can collect the toll tax from the vehicles in 30 years the private sector is allowed to collect 99000 crores this model is called public private partnership so what did we observe we observe that government is contributing something in the form of land private sector is doing the rest sometimes guys it is very costly to plan these projects and the private sector might find it very difficult to hire a proper advisory body or to hire some consultants who will do the planning and the design of the road etc it might be a very costly process so like planning consultancy and advisory related to the road construction might be very costly in that case the government of india has started a scheme called as india infrastructure project development fund iipdf whereby the government provides financial assistance up to rupees 5 crore per project proposal to the private sector so that they can undertake these kind of advisory consultancy and planning related to these public private partnership projects this is one second guys let us let us look into some important aspects of this road construction now <clears throat> you see this is your village and town which we were talking about and this is the road which is to be constructed now if i ask you a simple question that do you believe that economically and for the welfare of the society this road is important 100 percent yes which means economically this road is desirable but do you believe that 99000 crore is it is it viable or 80000 crore rupees cost of construction is it financially possible to have this road so easily in a country like india where we have a scarcity of resources no which means financially it looks very difficult unviable economically it makes sense the government of india says if something makes economic sense and social sense for social welfare if something is important government of india says don't worry if you are not able to construct this kind of road under public private partnership because of lack of cash then the government of india says that whatever is the total cost of construction example suppose the total cost of construction of this road is 100 crore it is economically viable but financially private sector is finding it difficult to arrange 100 crore government says up to 40 crore up to 40 crore will be provided by government of india so that this road construction can start this is called as viability gap funding so whenever an infrastructure is economically viable but there is a gap in the finance private sector is not able to arrange the cash government provides up to 40 percent of total project cost as financial assistance this is called as viability gap funding this model started in india in 2006 but la but last to last year the government made changes in this model 
So for example, in the year 2021-22, the government of India made changes in viability gap funding, which will be valid till 24-25. What is the change there? The government of India is still giving 40% of total project costs in normal cases. But there are two special cases where the government of India is doing something more. Example. So guys, we can divide the public infrastructure in two categories. The first type of public infrastructure is for example infrastructure like water treatment plant. They are basically social infrastructure. For example, in this water treatment plant, the polluted water can be converted into pure water which can be used for drinking purposes. The second kind of infrastructure is like schools and hospitals. Both are important. So if we talk about water treatment plant, suppose polluted water is taken, it is converted into clean water and that clean water is sold. So to establish that plant, suppose one crore is required, but to keep the plant running, salaries have to be paid, machines have to be bought. So one lakh rupees is required, suppose every day to keep the plant running. And the cost of setting up of the plant is 1 crore, but cost of running the plant is 1 lakh rupees every day. Very big plant, suppose. It takes care of the entire state. The government of India says that this is that type of infrastructure where it is 100% possible to recover the cost of operations and maintenance of the infrastructure. So cost of operation and maintenance is 1, crore, uh, 1 lakh rupees per day. The government said it is possible by charging for the water. So 100% recovery of the operations and maintenance cost is possible. In such a case, government says that to establish the plant, suppose 100 rupees is required. Central government says that center will contribute 30 rupees. State government will give 30 rupees. Private sector will give 40 rupees. This is viability gap funding. Center and state are providing 60% in this case. Not 40, but 60. And private sector is giving 40. And government says whatever is the operations cost, the private sector can recover it by putting user charges. Now there is another type of social infrastructure like hospital. So for example, suppose to set up a hospital, 100 rupees is required. Government says out of 100 rupees, 40 will be given by central government, 40 by state government and 20 by private sector. But suppose in running the hospital, every day 1 lakh rupees is required. Government of India says, that it is not possible to put the burden of 1 lakh rupees on the patients. So 50% of that 1 lakh will be recovered from patients through fee. Rest 50% the government of India says that will be provided by center and state. So if for example 1 lakh rupees is required in the maintenance of the hospital, running the hospital every day, 50,000 will be given by private sector. 25,000 by state government, 25,000 by central government. So 1 lakh rupees done. And this scheme will be applicable for first five years of the infrastructure. So these are those kind of infrastructure, hospital, school, etc. where operational cost recovery is only 50%, which means whatever is the cost of running the infrastructure, only 50% can be recovered by putting user charge, 100% cannot be recovered. Otherwise, it will put tremendous pressure on the society. So this is viability gap funding amendment which has been done and which is applicable since 2021. It is going to continue till 2024. Having done this guys, let us go and let us do the assessment of different sectors in the field of infrastructure. So the first sector that we are going to do is the road sector. So according to the economic survey, the survey says that in last four years, the allocation given by the government of India for construction of the road has been increasing. So every year government provides more money for construction of road. In the year 2022-23, 1.4 lakh crore was provided for road construction. There is also a mention of National Highway Authority of India, NHAI, Infrastructure Investment Trust, INVIT. Economic survey says that through INVIT, the government of India or National Highway Authority of India has been able to get 10,200 crore rupees through INVIT. Let me explain to you what is an invit. Now guys see, imagine that National Highway Authority of India, which is a government body, National Highway Authority of India has constructed a road. Road is the property or asset here. 
once the road construction is complete, people are using this road and whenever a vehicle passes from this road, toll tax is collected by National Highway Authority. Every day toll collection is in lakhs. Now the National Highway Authority of India appoints a trustee and gives the responsibility of this road on this trustee. So now this trustee will have the responsibility to manage and hold this road and National Highway Author Authority of India will not have any say in that. Then the National Highway Authority of India will establish an invit. So a trustee is set up, appointed. The trustee takes care of the road now. National Highway Authority of India appoints an invit. The job of the project manager will be to take care of the invit. So they will manage the invit. So NHAI sets up an invit, appoints a trustee, Trustee now takes care of, holds the asset road and the project manager looks after the operations of Invit. Now, an advertisement is put in the newspaper that if there is anybody in the economy who wants to invest, suppose I have 100 rupees, I want to invest. So I look at the advertisement, it says, bring your 100 rupees and give it to Invit. So suppose if you give 100 rupees to Invit, Invit will give you a piece of paper like this and in which will say that you are getting one unit and it will be mentioned on this piece of paper that you have contributed 100 rupees and in future in which is going to give you 100 plus something extra this extra money that you are going to get for your investment is called dividends so if you give 100 you will get extra as well this is your dividend so if you give 100 rupees to the in it goes to the government of India, National Highway Authority of India. And whenever toll tax is collected, a small amount of the toll tax is given to the investor as dividends. And who makes sure that toll tax is collected properly and dividend is given to the investor? Investment manager. Their function is to make sure that the road is in good condition. Their function is to make sure that dividends are given to the investor. So National Highway Authority of India created an invit behind the invit there is an asset called as road toll tax collection is happening and national highway authority of india was able to collect 10200 crore rupees as investment this 10200 crore went to the national highway authority of india and whenever toll tax is being collected a small amount of is of that is transferred to the investors as dividend this arrangement is for limited time period so what did we observe here there is an asset road that asset has been monetized because now this road is not giving only toll tax but this road is also giving you investors money this money can be used by national highway authority of india to construct roads in different parts of india so one road is giving us cash to construct road in another part of india this is also an example of asset monetization right so road sector was able to National Highway Authority of India was able to get 10,200 crores. Now guys, let us look at railway. In the field of railway, we have seen that there are two dedicated freight corridors in India. Freight corridor means this dedicated railway line will be used for movement of goods. And so far we have invested roughly 97,957 crores so that we can develop this freight corridor in India where movement of goods will happen through trains. This is interesting, why? Because it will also lead to the development of industrial townships in and around our dedicated freight corridors. Now let us look at Gati Shakti Multimodal Cargo Terminal. Remember I showed you this picture? So if you look at a railway station in India, there is surplus railway land in the railway station. And sometimes railway station does not have a surplus railway land, but there is land available elsewhere. Both the land can be used to construct this kind of infrastructure where there will be railway station. Uh, there is different modes of transportation like trucks are also there. There will be a small port also. These every kind of infrastructure and mode of transportation possible will be there. It will lead to faster movement of goods. It will reduce our cost of transportation because everything will be located at one place. Storage, transportation, packaging, all things will be done here. The government of India 
tells that if any private sector wants to develop this kind of place, the government is going to give them quick clearances and tax benefits will also be provided. This is called as Gati Shakti Multimodal Cargo Terminal. In India, we have developed the train called as Vande Bharat train, which is semi-high speed, where the maximum speed is 160 kilometers per hour. The train is being developed in Chennai. The train has GPS system as well as anti-collision system called as Kavach, which prevents the head-on collisions between trains. We are also working on hyperloop technology in India. So this is a collaboration between Indian Railway and IIT Madras, where the government of India has allocated 8.34 crore rupees. So for example, look at this tunnel. This tunnel has low pressure and this pod, pod means this transportation system, this has high pressure. So high pressure pod is moving inside low pressure. So there is minimum resistance and the speed will be very high, very smooth transportation system. This is called hyperloop technology. We are also running Kisan Rail in this country, guys. So under Kisan Rail, what is happening? So if you go to the east and northeast of India, they are very good in horticulture, fruits, vegetable, etc. So horticulture from one part of India is loaded on this train and it is taken to different parts of India where horticulture is not available. Fruits, vegetable are very costly. So, so far we have run 2,359 such trains. So Kisan Rail. In the field of civil aviation, one of the biggest problems that happened was during COVID because there was total lockdown and because of that flight services were totally cancelled. So if you compare that whether there has been revival in the field of civil aviation, we will see that the number of passenger movement in 2022 is greater than pre-COVID means 2019, which means full recovery. But the cargo movement means movement of goods in 2022 is less than pre-COVID since 2019. It shows that there is a slowdown as well and industrial production has also come down. And it also shows that more roads are being used rather than flights. Then there is a scheme called Udan or Regional Connectivity Scheme. What is the scheme? Under the scheme, the government of India is constructing airports in small cities of India and government is trying to promote more flights there. The ticket price of the flights are also reasonable. And if the airlines suffer a loss when they run a flight between, for example, let's say Delhi to, let's say, Kangra. Kangra is in Himachal. Kangra is a regional center. And if an airline is running a flight between Delhi and Kangra or Delhi and Gaya, and if they suffer a loss, the government of India provides them cash subsidy. So far, one crore people have used the low cost airline services in different regional centers of India under the scheme called Udan. It is also called as the Regional Connectivity Scheme. Now, <clears throat> guys, the government of India has also st started to focus more on the movement of people and goods through our inland waterways. See, the government of India introduced National Waterway Act 2016 in which 111 national waterways have been identified. The river system in India. We are blessed with rivers, inland rivers. So for example, one state of India is connected with another state through rivers. So the government of India has identified 111 such waterways and is promoting the movement of goods and services there and movement of people. If we look at the different states of India and try to find out that which state has the most navigable length of waterway, the highest length of waterway which is navigable, it's West Bengal, followed by Assam, Kerala, Odisha, etc. And the total length of navigable waterway in India is 14,850 kilometers, out of which maximum is in West Bengal. Now, <clears throat> the government of India also introduced Indian Vessel Bill 2021. This Indian Vessel Bill 2021 has replaced the 100-year-old Indian Vessel Act 1917. According to the new Indian Vessel Bill 2021, there are some important provisions there. For example, suppose I am the West Bengal government and I have a river system in my state. If I want, I can declare a particular inland river system in my state as a zone. I will say that this river system will be called as a zone. Now, if anybody wants to run a ship there or mechanized boats there, they will have to take my permission. Now, similarly, the government of India, the central government is maintaining the data related to all the inland waterways and the movement there digitally. 
And also under this bill, it has been mentioned that we will try to minimize the pollution which is happening in the river system of India or the inland waterways. So this is inland vessel bill. If you look at the power sector in India, we will find that out of the total capacity of electricity that we have, roughly 59.1% of the electricity that we have, that capacity is contributed by thermal energy, right? Which means coal based energy. Coal is used in the generation of electricity. Its contribution is 59.1% in our total electricity. Contribution of renewable energy is 27.5, hydro 11.7, nuclear 1.7. If we look at the growth of energy, which energy form of energy is growing in India? So if we look at the growth between 2020 and 2021, we see that thermal energy in India increased by 1.6% per year per annum. Renewable energy increased by 16.2, hydro 1.1 and nuclear zero, which means maximum growth was observed in renewable energy, which is desirable. So we can say that India is experiencing energy transition from conventional source, this is conventional coal based to renewable. Similarly guys, the government of India has set a target that by the year 2030, we want that the share of renewable sources of energy or non fossil fuel based energy should be 50%. Currently it's 40%. We want it to be 50%. Currently majority of energy in India is coming from thermal energy sources, 60%, roughly 59.1 or 60%. We want to reduce it. The government of India has started a program called as PM Kusum. What is happening under PM Kusum? Look at this agricultural field. In the agricultural field, solar power plant has been established. This plant will give electricity to the, to the farmer and the farmer can even sell this electricity. Plus, the government of India is motivating the farmers to not use the diesel based irrigation system or motors, but instead use solar based pumps. Pumps are used to draw water from the well and, uh, and the canals and then use it for irrigation purposes. So government is promoting the farmers to use solar based pumps and not diesel based pumps. So this scheme PM Kusum will help the farmers in both energy security as well as increase the income of the farmers. Guys, having talked about all the sectoral performance, let us have a look at what the government of India has been doing in terms of expenditure on infrastructure in this country. So I remember that since last two years, the government of India has been talking a lot in the budget about increasing expenditure in infrastructure, in construction of railway station, roads, hospitals, school. This is called capital expenditure, CAPEX. So let us see if the government of India has been actually doing it. So if we observe, let's have a look at the year nine, uh, let's have a look at the year 2020 and 21. Then 21 and 22, 22 and 23, last three years. You see, three years back, the government of India was spending 4.1 lakh crore on capital expenditure, which increased to 5.5 lakh crore, 34% increase. Then the government of India increased the capital expenditure to 7.5 lakh crore. So from 5.5 lakh crore, 7.5 lakh crore. This is 35% increase in capital expenditure. So 34% increase, 35% increase, which means yes, it is increasing. And IMF has said that this increase in capital expenditure by government of India is helping in two things. It is helping in our economic revival because we got affected by COVID. And second, it is also helping to attract more private investment and more industries in India. This is called as crowding in. So IMF has said these two points. Now guys, we enter into digital infrastructure and see what has happened in the field of digital technology. In the field of digital infrastructure, we are first going to understand what is the meaning of digital public infrastructure. You see, for example, if we are making a payment through smartphone, which is online payment through UPI. Similarly, if we want to access healthcare services online or we want to you know, apply for a loan, for a home loan, or suppose we want to have digital education, for all these things, there is a system which has been established called as digital platform. So digital public infrastructure is that system or that platform using which all the digital services are provided by the government to the society. That is called as digital public infrastructure. 
How did the digital public infrastructure evolve in India? The evolution of digital public infrastructure happened in India through various stages, typically four stages. See, if the government of India wants to provide, for example, benefits of a scheme to a citizen, first of all, government of India must know whether that particular citizen is eligible to receive the scheme. So identification of the citizen, identification of the beneficiary became the first step. So the government of India introduced the system of Aadhaar. Aadhaar cards, Aadhaar system was introduced in 2009 so as to verify who should get the benefits of which scheme. Now suppose benef beneficiary identification has been done. Now, if I want to avail some service by the government of India, I should know if I'm eligible or not. So where will I go and check? I will go and check on my scheme. My scheme is that facility whereby government of India has put all the schemes. And if you want to check whether you are eligible to receive the benefits under a scheme, you can go on my scheme and check your eligibility. Once you check your eligibility, then suppose you are eligible and you want to avail the scheme related to agriculture, health or education. Where will you go? You will go on Umang. Umang is that platform where the beneficiaries can go and actually use all the schemes given by government of India based on your eligibility. And once you know which scheme you are going to use, that is called doorstep delivery of services. So this is the evolution of digital public infrastructure in India. Now, in the year 2015, the government of India introduced a scheme called as Digital India. Under it, the government of India set some target which we wanted to achieve and which we are still trying to do. The focus of Digital India is to provide high speed internet connection. And how is the government of India providing high speed inter internet connection? Through Bharatnet. So through Bharatnet, the government of India is trying to provide broadband connection in Gram Panchayats. Similarly, through Comprehensive Telecom Development Plan, the government of India is expanding the telecom and internet services in Northeast. Through Kani Project, the government of India is expanding the connectivity in Chennai and uh, between Chennai and Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Through KLI project, the government is expanding the connectivity between Kochi and Lakshadweep. And the government of India is also trying to motivate our Indian manufacturers of telecom equipments so that they can produce better quality products and export more through a scheme called PLI, Production Linked Incentives. Similarly, the government of India has an agenda that everybody should get broadband facility in India so that giving digital services becomes easy for the government so that everybody can get banking, healthcare and educational services online. So that program is called Gati Shakti Sanchar Portal 2022. Similarly, the government of India is trying to promote digital finance. How is digital finance being promoted? Through unified payment interface, open credit enablement network and account aggregator. So we are going to study these three and let's see what the government is doing to promote digital finance. So guys, all of us are aware with UPI system. So suppose I have a bank account with HDFC. My friend has a bank account with, for example, SBI. I want to transfer money from HDFC to my friend's account in SBI. How do I do that? I go to UPI and then I transfer the money from my account to my friend's account. Both these banks are available on the portal called UPI. UPI is the common platform where all the banks are available. It's an open platform. If UPI, UPI were not there, I might have to visit the banks physically to transfer the money. UPI has solved the problem. Now look at the UPI transaction over the period of time in terms of lakh crores. So look at the UPI transaction, how it has increased. In fact, if you look at the progress in the year 2018, roughly 35 banks were using UPI and 17% of digital money transaction used to happen through UPI. In the year 2021, 380 banks are a part of UPI and roughly 52% digital transaction happens only through UPI. Similarly guys, the government of India has been promoting open credit enablement network, OCEAN. What is happening under that? Suppose I am a small borrower. My requirement of credit is very small. Now, I don't know if I'm eligible to get loan and I don't know who will provide me loan. So what I can do is I have my Aadhaar and KYC. I will come on this platform. On this platform, my screening will be done and they will check if I'm eligible 
to get loan and if I am eligible, who can provide me loan if I am a small borrower? That information will be provided to me. So that's a great thing for small borrowers. Similarly, there is something called as account aggregator. You see what happens under that is, suppose guys, I have a bank account with SBI. I want to take a loan with SDFC, right? So how will I get a loan? If I go to SDFC, SDFC might take a lot of time to find out if my credit history is good or not, if I'm in a position to return the money or not. So what can happen is HDFC bank can contact account aggregator. Account aggregator is a third party. Let's say it's a company. This account aggregator company will take my permission and say that, uh, can they use my information, my banking details, etc my income, my money that is there in my SBI account, can they share that information with HDFC? So that it becomes easy for SDFC to find out if they can give loan to me or not. So account aggregator basically take your permission and they share your information related to your, your banking and financial history and your credit worthiness with other institutions so that it becomes easy for you to avail the services. So other than digital finance guys, the government of India is also promoting public cloud. So for example, if you want to start a business, you take different permissions from the government of India. Those permissions are stored digitally in some digital storage facility like some digi locker. Similarly guys, if you are getting your passport, licenses and other approvals from government of India, all these things can be digitally stored in digi locker called as public cloud. The government of India is also trying to promote cyber security in this country so that all the online transactions etc are safe and secure. And one of the important uh, targets under digital India is government is trying to promote knowledge society. How? So let us look at OpenForge, Bhashini and National AI portal. You see what is OpenForge? So for example, guys, we all use LPG cylinders. So for example, government of India has developed a mobile application through which you can book your LPG cylinder. Now the government of India feels that app can be improved. So the government of India puts that app. See, every app is created using a code. So the government of India puts the app on OpenForge portal. And here, if anybody feels that they can improve the app by contributing something, they can do that. Similarly, Bhashini is that facility given by government of India where speech is converted into text, text is converted into speech. So 11 different languages have that permission here, whereby if you speak it and it can be converted to text, text can be converted into speech. So this facility is available on this uh, Bhashini. Now national AI portal, artificial intelligence can prove to be a big asset for a country and an economy. It has wide spread applications. So whatever development is happening in the field of artificial intelligence, whether it is in government sector, private sector, NGOs, wherever, all that information is available on national AI portal. And one of the last things that I want to share with you in the field of digital public infrastructure is Open Network for Digital Commerce, ONDC. See, I'll tell you a simple story. Suppose you are a consumer. You want to, for example, travel from one place to another. You will use Ola and Uber app, different app. And you are this consumer. Suppose you want to buy grocery from Amazon. You will use this app. Suppose you want to buy groceries from Flipkart, this app. Suppose you want to order food from Swiggy, another app, Zomato, another app. Right. And suppose if you want to buy something from offline store, that offline store is not listed. It is not available on Amazon and Flipkart, then you can't buy products from there online. So you are very confused and you are very sort of tired of downloading different mobile app. Similarly, this offline seller, suppose he sells very good notebooks and pens, but he is not able to go on Amazon and Flipkart because Amazon and Flipkart are charging high commission from him. So he's a small seller, he's not able to go there. To solve these kind of problems and to make the online shopping and online transaction more democratic, the government of India is doing exactly what they have done through UPI. In UPI, different banks have come and payment has become easy. Similarly, the government of India is replicating the model in online shopping. So what is the government of India doing? The government of India is creating an open platform like this. See, now everybody is there on the platform. So the government of India has created an open platform called as ONDC, Open Network for Digital Commerce. All those service providers who want 
to be a part of it can register. Now suppose you are a consumer, you want to buy a pen. Now the moment you type pen in the search bar there, all the sellers of the pen, whether they are on Amazon, Flipkart or wherever, their names will pop out and you can avail the service. And if they are not able to courier you the pen, there will be a logistic supplier also. Packaging, transportation, storage and they will courier the pen to you. Similarly, that offline store which was not able to be a part of Amazon and Flipkart because of commission. There is no commission on ONDC. Even offline stores can sell online also. They will become hybrid stores. It's an open platform. So the government of India is trying to create a more democratic kind of digital public infrastructure in India. For that, we need to create good digital rules and regulations for this country because only having facilities is not good enough because with you know facilities comes the risk. There is a risk of you know cyber security theft through transactions etc etc. So to take care of these the digital regulation is also very important that has been argued in the economic survey. This concludes our lecture on infrastructure. Thank you so much. See you with the next lecture.